Hello, I'm Britt Royer, the curator at St. Mary's College Museum of Art in Moraga, California. And I am here today with Lisa Congdon for the opening of her exhibition, Hold It Lightly. Lisa, welcome. Thank you, it's so good to be here. Hold It Lightly came about from an invitation from our museum out to Lisa to create a dialogue and a body of work in response to legendary pop artist Krita Kent. This fall we will be opening Krita's series Heroes and Shiros, which came from the 1968-69 time period. Um, this will be the first time this series will be publicly received on the West Coast. And so being able to invite Lisa here to create a body of work in response to Krita's pieces creates an opportunity to really explore the dialogue of design and impact. And so today we want to dive into specifically Hold It Lightly and what this exhibit is about. Um, turning more specifically to Krita Kent. Um, what are the elements of her work that have informed your art practice? Well, it was, first of all, I want to say it was such an honor to be invited to do this exhibition. Um, I'm not only an alumna of St. Mary's College, um, I graduated in 1990, but Corita Kent has been a huge influence on my work and my art practice and my teaching uh, for the last 20 years. So this was, kind of a dream come true for me. So I'm just really thrilled to be here. Ben Sean, who's another um, influential artist from the mid-century, uh, referred to Corita as a joyous revolutionary. And I really love this term, and there's actually a poster in the exhibit Yay. that you know pays homage to, to that reference. Um, I, I love that because in this world, um, you know, when especially when you're an artist, I think there's this um, this belief. Sometimes it's an internal belief that you project, and sometimes it's I think the pressure from, you know, society. But we think, okay, if I'm an artist, you know, my art has to be about the struggle and the pain. And what I love about Corita's work is that her work is about the, the struggle and the pain, but she also um, allowed herself to experience joy um, in communion with pain. Uh, we like to think of everything as being on this kind of binary, right? Like yeah. you're either in the struggle or you're joyous. And what I love about her work and her approach to her work that has really informed me and not just my art, but the way I live my life um, is being in that sort of intersection or that gray area between pain and joy. And um, that, it, that it's okay to feel joy despite the struggle. And I think that's such an important message right now in the world because the world can feel very broken and divided, and we don't often give ourselves permission, or we or we maybe feel guilty for feeling joy, yeah. um, because so many terrible things are happening um, in the world, and that I don't know that notion of like joy being a joyous revolutionary, somebody who sort of fights for good in the world, but is also um, living in happiness and joy and trying to also find joy in things is kind of central to what I do. So, so that's one aspect of her work that's really resonates. Um, one thing too, I think with this element of joy was thinking through the visual language of mm -hmm. how that's expressed. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when you see Krita's work and then you look at Lisa's work, you can see that language and that thread coming through. And mm -hmm. so one of those elements that I know we have spoken about a bit is this idea of play mm -hmm. um, and what that looks like. And so I was wondering if you can dive into that a little bit mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. about this concept of play and embracing play within mm -hmm. art and design. Yeah, that's another huge uh, influence of Corita on my work is this embracing of play. And it's not, it's, it sort of infiltrates not just my work, but also my process 
and, um, and my teaching. So how I, when I'm teaching other people art or when I'm teaching other people, um, even how to, you know, kind of like live, you know, make a living as a working artist, um, this notion of play feels really important to me. I'm self-taught, so I never, um, you know, I went to St. Mary's College back in the late 80s and I studied history and I never actually went back to school to get my MFA or an art degree. I kind of fell into it um, when I was in my early 30s, fell into art making. And um, because I'm self-taught, uh, I didn't know, I didn't think of making art as, you know, some kind of heavy um, academic um I need Act. to like transform yeah. the world yeah. right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was more like, I want to have fun. I feel inspired to make art. I don't know if I'm doing it right, if there is a right way. Yeah. Um, which, of course, in the beginning, I thought maybe there was and that I was somehow, you know, uh, faking it or <laughs> something. But I, I thought of, you know, art was for me this thing I did outside of my job. And um, it was this way to relax and... Um, have fun and I would hole up in my apartment and um, I would go out in the night at nighttime with my friends but during the day I would spend entire days you know making stuff in my apartment and it was my way to unwind and relax and it brought me so much happiness and this was way before I even was showing my work to anybody or posting pictures of it on the internet it was just this thing that I did that brought me joy and um, so even today in my art practice, uh, play is a really important part of kind of how I approach my work from, you know, the way that I choose colors and color combinations and um, the way that I um, represent different motifs in my work. Uh, my work is very graphic. I'm very influenced by graphic design. And um, so everything is hand drawn, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always kind of thinking about how to put things together in a really kind of like intentional, playful way. And, you know, in the gallery here at the museum, in both galleries, you know, we've got, you know, I, I commented yesterday, we were walking through after we were painted, painting the, the galleries, and I said, it looks like a preschool yeah. in here. <laughs> this was before any art was hung, but, you know, there is something about my work that is, you know, super kid-friendly. Um, there's a simplicity to my work. Um, I, I work in sort of the same... I mean, this show, basically, I think I, I'm working from the same six or seven colors, maybe max. Um, and I'm really excited to be using like neon fluorescent colors yeah. in my work because that also is a nod to Karita. She really embraced that in her mm -hmm. serographs. And that comes so visible with the heroes yes. and heroes with yes. like the bright pink, yes. um, the bright orange. Yeah, the neons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's another way that we're sort of like in conversation. But Color is such a great way. My letter forms also are a great way to, you know, to play, um, making things, turning things on their head, turning yeah. things upside down. And, um, you know, I also like to create a fun environment in my studio. And I have a team of people who work with me. I'm super fortunate to do that. And we're always blasting music and, you know, being silly and um, not taking ourselves too seriously, which... We can talk about this more later, but Hold It Lightly is really about not taking things Yay. too seriously. So that's a really important part of kind of the way I approach my life and my work. Yeah, and now that you brought that up with Hold It Lightly, it's the title of our show and the exhibition. And so I was wondering if you could share a little bit about where that came from. Yeah, um, a lot of what's in this show are a lot of the, the messages, the sort of written messages in the show, which is a big part of my art practice and it was a big part of Karita's art practice as well, um, in, in are really um, messages about things that I've learned in my life. Um, I turned 55 this year, so um, I still consider myself uh, like 30 years old <laughs> inside, but I'm getting older and I've learned a lot, especially in the last 10 years. There's something about getting older that like um, is such a beautiful experience because you learn to have perspective on things that, that it, you know, maybe when you were 25 or 30 were extremely painful or hard to wrap your head around. And mm -hmm. um, things that used to keep me up at night no longer keep me up at night. Um, and it's not because I don't care. It's just that I think about them differently. Mm -hmm. And 
One of the things that I've learned is, or one of the most important things I've learned in my life is this idea that um, uh, attachment to anything, whether it's an outcome or a thing or a person, can often be the thing that creates pain. Mm. And um, it's a very Buddhist notion, actually. Yeah, I can see <laughs> um, that. You know, that attachment is at the root of, of pain and struggle. And it's easy to understand that intellectually, but it's harder to live it. And one of the ways that I try to remind myself of this is kind of to imagine taking something that feels heavy or important to me. Like maybe it's a relationship with a person, a person I really love, and I want that person to be in my life forever. Or it's a thing that I have or a goal that I have. You know, I'm a uh, a competitive cyclist and I, you know, I, you know, I want very badly to be on a podium, um, at a particular race in my age group or something. And so whatever it is, I try to, you know, have aspirations, but also, or, and to love deeply, you know, the people in my life, but also to, to hold those things lightly and mm -hmm. to know that, um, I don't really have control over the outcome. And, I found that when I sort of visualize myself holding things lightly, literally in my hands, like things that I want, um, it's uh, kind of a relief and makes me feel like I'm softening a little bit and then I don't feel as stressed out. And it's become a really important practice in my life and an important mantra. And so when I was thinking about what to call the show, there's so many things I could have called it because <laughs> yeah. um, as people will see, there are lots of different messages in the work. Um, some are overlapping, some are, you know, sort of not, not contradictory to each other, but, you know, sort of different ideas. But this one felt really important to me because um, it sort of is the thing that has helped me in the last decade of my life feel like a more joyful, happy person because I'm not holding, holding on tightly to, to much of anything anymore. And it's been such a great lesson for me. With hold it lightly and the phrase itself um, and coming forward with this kind of affirmation that's reflective of this lesson, it makes visible a lot of the self-growth that your work reflects. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, you know, my work hasn't always included uh, um, these messages. Uh, the word affirmation makes me uncomfortable even though it's true. And I think it's because I think of like that Saturday Night Live. Yeah. <laughs> with, you it's like know, positive yeah. like, images of um, um, sunsets. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I need to own it. Um, so when I, you know, my work hasn't always really like had messages in it. And what's interesting is I didn't come in to using words in my work. Uh, because I needed a place to express myself, I used to do that purely through visuals, and I still do. I actually, I was, I am a professional illustrator, and I had an agent at the, you know, earlier on in my career who was like, you're gonna get more work if you um, learn how to do kind of hand lettering and express messages in your work because it's becoming very popular. Okay. And that was my way in. Yeah. And so I did this project in 2011, I think, or maybe it was 2012, and it was called 365 Days of Hand Lettering. And so it was my own personal project that I did where I hand lettered something every day for a year. And my goal was just to get better at hand lettering. But in the process, I started making work that had words and phrases and, you know, you know, originally it was like a lot of quotes by other people as a form of practice, yeah. but then eventually that felt very um, kind of overdone to me. So I was like, I really just want to express my own words in my artwork. And so I, I sort of made, eventually made that shift and found that it was really powerful for me and for my audience, you know, the people who are, you know, um, consuming my work and by consuming I don't mean purchasing necessarily but like people who are taking it Visually in. taking it yeah in. and I was like oh I'm onto something I enjoy doing this and other people are responding to it and you know um, it's resonating for people and so that's how it started 
And it was really a great example for me of um, this sort of demonstration of uh, expressing what was important to me to people, which can often feel very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, because it felt really important to me also that whatever I was putting out there in terms of a message was um, something that I had personal experience with. Mm -hmm. It's not my goal to be a guru or to be you know, the person who knows everything yeah. and is telling other people how to live their life. This, all of, the, all of the, the phrases in my work are based on my own personal experience, whether it was like some terrible mistake that I made that I had a really hard time forgiving myself for, um, or you know, some moment where I realized something really profound about how I had been living my life and how I could live my life differently. Um, and that process of sharing stories and artwork about my own personal growth yeah. um, was really profound for me and often, as I said, made me feel really vulnerable. But what I found happened was that people were really responding to that mm -hmm. because I was being vulnerable and I was sharing that, you know, hey, this thing happened to me or I caused this terrible thing to happen and I learned this from it and now I try to remember this thing when I'm in a similar situation. And I think because of that, my work comes across, I think to a lot of people as being authentic or real or as opposed to just, you know, I think there are a lot of people out there who put out statements about life or living life, but maybe they don't feel authentic. Mm -hmm. um, and I really try to practice what I preach and I do consider myself an evangelist for, <laughs> for certain things, but I try to not be, you know, like, um, I try to ground it in my own personal flawed human experience. And that feels really important to me. And I think that's kind of like at the root of my voice or my art practice. And I think that to me is what really makes your artwork unique. When we think about an artist and how they're positioned is often there's this aura mm -hmm. of mystery, mm -hmm. right? Like you, you only see their art and they're very much divorced from that. And so mm -hmm. this element of how you bring your whole self into mm -hmm. it and have that visibility of vulnerability creates this intersection um, with the world around you. Yeah, it's so interesting. I um, am a mentor for a group of um, artists of color who are sort of emerging in their professional careers at, through a, um, a collective that I started with my friend Emily. And we were having a meeting last night about this very topic of like what it feels like as an artist to, to make connections with your audience, even if you never meet the person, right? But to try to connect with your audience by being human and by being flawed and by being a face in, in front of your artwork. And for some people that comes very naturally and easily. And for some people it's really hard. And um, I feel really lucky because I'm at least at the point where I really started to, you know, have a presence on the internet, um, I had was old enough at least that I felt comfortable in my own skin to do that. Not that it's not nerve wracking from time to time, you know, um, and not that I don't have haters, you know, or people who don't disagree with things that I talk about, because I do. Um, but I've had to learn that, like, you know, not everybody's going to like what you do, and not everybody's going to feel comfortable with your, you know, expression of yourself. So. Um, but the important thing is that I show up and you speak my truth, right? Because that's really the, the job of the artist. Yeah, and when I think about this idea of how your artwork does like touch and you're thinking about how it's being received and meeting people where they're at, you see a lot of that connection with Karita. And I think this ties us back to even the medium that we see in this exhibit of um, silk screens or serographs mm -hmm. as we were referring to them. Um, so what has that experience been like in terms of this body of work working in prints? It's been really amazing. When you first approached me about having this show, I, I was like, okay, I have nine, I'd have nine months to get ready. And I was trying to envision filling both spaces with paintings. And so normally when I have exhibitions, I paint. And it's a big part of my yeah. practice and I love it, but it's very time consuming. But instantly I thought, oh, wait a second. What if I made serographs? What if I made screen prints? 
um, instead of uh, paintings. And it made the most sense because if I'm going to be in conversation with Karita's mm -hmm. work, then you know that's what she did. That was her medium. So I've done screen printing before and had my work screen printed, but never for a show and never at this you know this number. And so it was. It made the process so fun for me because I really had to focus on drawing. Um, so I draw on an iPad. I draw digitally now, and um, and I have since about 2017. And um, so I was able to take both older work and kind of simplify it in, you know, screen prints. We decided that this show would be, prints would be between one and four colors okay. each. And so my job was to, to figure out, A, what work I wanted in the show, how big I wanted each piece to be, what were the dimensions. And then about 50 to 60% of it is um, older work that I kind of transformed into two or, or redrew into mm -hmm. two or three colors, um, which in some cases was really hard. Um, <laughs> um, in some cases was really challenging and fun. And some of the pieces are only one color and that, that part was easy. And then I limited myself to a certain number of colors because um, screen printing can also be really expensive and yeah. I didn't want to like explode the budget. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> we're doing because, 10 right, colors. Because we're doing <laughs> editions of 50, of 57 yeah. prints, right? It's a lot. And so it just made the process really fun and relaxing for me because I wasn't thinking about, oh, I have to execute this, you know, this number of paintings um, in this amount of time, which preparing for an exhibition can be really stressful, mm -hmm. um, especially when you're painting. And so in this way, I, I was sort of, I mean, making 57 pieces of art, even if you're working 50% of it from older work, is still a huge, yeah. you know, a huge endeavor. And I think what was really exciting about this process was your enthusiasm to come into it and like, I'm going to create a body of work and we're going to do this. Yeah. And so it was this continual yeah. kind of conversation yeah. thread. Yeah. Here comes the next um, yeah. batch. Here comes, the, Here next comes batch. the next batch. And Amy, who is my, essentially my, the other side, the other half of my brain, um, <laughs> who works for me and is basically my art director and my confidant and my um, organizer, she made this amazing spreadsheet that basically said by this date you have to finish this many pieces of art and this because we also then had to get them to the screen printer I, we didn't screen print all of this stuff yeah. ourselves so we worked with a screen printer and he basically blocked off a month and a half just to finish our stuff yeah. so there was a timeline that had to keep going because we had to send things to you guys in batches to have it framed and it ended up being this really exhilarating process for me and um, one that I really enjoyed. And then I ended up making a bunch of new work for the show yeah, to kind of which is um, finish it out. So there's stuff that's in the show that has never been seen before. Mm -hmm. And um, so I really love working this medium and it won't be the last time. This is my, my first exhibition of um, Sarah Graphs. There's also two um, three-dimensional uh, uh, installations that I'm doing, but... Um, yeah, it's just been so much fun and I'm glad that it worked out, uh, this way that, you know, that it worked out that, you know, Karita's was going to be showing screen prints. I was showing screen prints, you know, and well, and I really think in fun. terms of too, right, it's just so accessible and it's that yes. direct interaction with people, the public. And we think about Karita who also worked with a separate printmaker, um, thinking about how she's approaching it in the 60s, mm -hmm. right? She has these layout plans that are literally like, I have photograph here, text here, and mm -hmm. putting all these pieces together. And so when we even look at your artwork and how you're creating these specific curations of, I'm gonna take this element here, I'm gonna fit this letter here, right? It's puzzle piecing this together. And I think prints really kind of capture that space. Yeah. Um, well, I wanna say too that like, in Karita's day, she was cutting things out of magazines yeah. and she was using photographs. Um, screen printing was, you can do it the way that she did it, but it was very different and very mm -hmm. sort of like hand, her hand was in it. I'm working on an iPad with things in layers and color yeah. layers. And so I'm also placing, but I'm placing using this modern tool. Yeah. And that's really cool too. It's like similar approaches and I think she would have really loved working digitally because you have so much freedom to move things around and play in a way that you don't um, it's almost like taking you know she was collaging things together mm -hmm. and I'm collaging things together but 
you know, digitally. Mm -hmm. And I'm also, there's a lot of repeating imagery in my work, mm -hmm. and symbols that I use over and over. So I don't have to redraw them every time. I literally have a bank of imagery that I pull from so that I can, you know, place things in different, I mean, I do draw things a lot, but I have imagery that's very consistent in my work and I just pull from one piece and put something in another piece. And that really kind of makes my work kind of all hang together. You often repeat and revisit certain motifs in your work, the tiger, the dove, scissors, <laughs> telephones. Um, can you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, I've, I've sort of always used, even before I was, you know, drawing digitally, I've like, I mean, my work has become more graphic since I've become a more digital artist. But, you know, back when I was using paint and ink, um, I, I've always been really drawn to symbolism both visually, like because the simplicity of symbols is so appealing to me, um, but also because of what things, you know, it's an easy way to um, tell a story in a more abstract way. Mm -hmm. um, so I've always been drawn, drawn to symbols. And as you mentioned, some of them are really common symbols in kind of folklore or cultures around the world, like the snake or the bird, the dove, right? We all kind of have an idea of what those things might represent. Um, but a lot of my symbols are personal symbols, like the telephone. There's, there's no milk cartons in this show, but that's another one that comes up for me because like drinking milk was like a really big part of my childhood. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I, I also love taking symbols and making kind of organized arrangements of them. And there are a couple pieces in the show where, where you see that and, so I love both symbolism, combining symbols, um, using symbols with words, and then arranging symbols in, you know, in this way where it's sort of like my way of taking the chaos of the world or this the disorderliness of the world yeah. and making something beautiful out of it. Yeah, and I think what's also so beautiful with the symbols, right, is there is some universality to them, and so they have specific meaning mm -hmm. to you, but it's also something when people yeah. receive them, it Everyone goes, can relate. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, I remember once on Instagram I posted this um, uh, painting that I had made of an orange juice carton because when I was a kid we all drank orange juice out of a, out of a carton yeah. every morning and um, and then I was talking about how you know you would eat your cereal after you drank your orange juice and the milk would always taste really sour <laughs> yeah. and then we got I got I asked everyone what their favorite cereal was when they were a kid and I think that you know image of the orange juice carton that I had painted Plus, talking about childhood breakfast was probably one of the most engaged um, Instagram posts I've ever yeah. made, right? <laughs> it's because it's nostalgic for yeah. people. And so a lot of what I, I use in my work are, you know, like I, I always am drawing pictures of rotary phones because yeah. I grew up in the 70s, so that was a big part of, you know, my childhood. So what do you hope people will gain in the experience from visiting Hold It Lightly? When people come to this show, I hope they feel inspired to be more loving towards themselves and others. A big focus for me was this idea of like radical love. Um, both, and what makes love radical is like loving despite differences or despite any hatred you might have towards yourself or other people, mm -hmm. things about yourself or other people you don't like. I mean, to love radically um, means that you love despite, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That people are also, you know, questioning their own relationships with other people um, and with themselves. Like, how can I accept myself? And other people um, radically um, and how could I live with more joy and more play that is also um, kind of at the heart of my messaging and feels really important to me I mean most of all I just hope people have a good time and laugh and smile a lot yeah when you think about your time in St. Mary's I'm sure a lot of feelings come back what are some of the ones that stand out at the top I absolutely loved my time here. It was probably next to the current phase of my life, 
the happiest time of my life. I came from a really big high school. And so coming here was really amazing for me because there was this sense of community and really people really knowing you. Um, so not just classmates. I mean, I built friendships that are lifelong and, you know, um, I'm still friends with so many people that I met while I was here, but also I had never had such close relationships with um, professors and you know people who lived in the dorms and then the Christian brothers were like such amazing you know loving people. Um, they could also be very strict, but <laughs> but like, you know my experience was super positive. Um, I do also you know I think it was the first time in my life that I ever um, embraced critical thinking and. Um, you know, we, we read all these things that at the time just felt so, you know, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey and like all the great books, right? Or not all of them, but many of them. And, um, you know, you come in as a freshman and you're like, oh, you know, but then you're having all of these intellectual conversations for the first time in your life. And at least for me, that was true. And I really loved that. Um, and I think I grew so much as a person and I think it really kind of like set me up to be an artist in a way like, you know, painting and drawing was not something I ever did or thought that I was good at when I was younger. And so, um, but I do think that this idea of like questioning and critical thinking and curiosity, um, was the, the like foundation for that was 100% built here on this campus. Um, and, you know, I do remember a lot of parties, so <laughs> there's that. <laughs> but uh, I was also one of those, um, one of those students that would um, prioritize studying over going to the pub, um, which was some, sometimes hard, but I think it, um, I ended up getting very good grades while I was here. And so um, I think part of it, you know, I have this like sense of discipline that has been in me since I was a little girl. And, um, and I think that was developed here. I wrote my senior thesis my junior year. So yeah, I was one of, the, I was one of those kids. So yeah, anyway, it was amazing. And you know, I think there were people here who um, really made me, it was the first time I ever felt smart. And that, um, that I learned how to write and, um, and I, um, understood the power of my mind in a way, you know, I mean, I became an adult here and um, went off to do a lot of amazing things with my life after I left here that I never could have imagined. And I do think that my education here had a huge um, impact on that. And, and also the community of people who nurtured me here was really pretty amazing. And one last question yeah. is, uh, was there a particular professor course or extracurricular that really stands out that maybe was a catalyst? So um, it is no secret that my favorite professor here was Brother Ron Izetti. And he left, uh, and he actually, I think he left the Brotherhood uh, after I graduated. And for a hot second, somewhere in the last 30 years, we were in touch. But I think I found him on the internet or something. But he was and I'm not alone in this. I mean, so many of my friends loved him. I actually became a history major because of him. Um, he was uh, such a great lecturer, and he used to write these outlines on the chalkboard of everything he was going to cover in a lecture. And so everything was so organized and well thought out. And, and at the same time, he was such a passionate speaker, and he knew so much. And I think he's really the first person who introduced me to this idea of like, you know, uncovering his, history as like, what is the, what actually really happened? Not what is the history that we've been told, but what, mm -hmm. what actually happened from the perspective of, um, you know, marginalized people, for example, mm -hmm. or people from different countries. And that was really profound for me. He was like a really progressive thinker and I really just adored him. And he was my mentor all the way through. And um, really, was, even though I, you know, I don't, I never went on to get my PhD in history or t teach history. Like that um, connection with him and the way he taught was a huge influence on me. Yeah. 
I'm sure there are some people who don't like to consume art, don't want to go to a museum, don't think it's valuable for whatever reason or another. What would you say to, to, to those folks? Well, I do relate to a lot of that. Sometimes I don't want to go to a museum um, <laughs> necessarily. Um, you know, museums traditionally ha are these sort of places that are very highbrow and very um, inaccessible. And even the way that work is written about is written in a language that almost feels foreign. They can be very pretentious. And um, I think that's changing in a lot of places, even places that show work that's from the Middle Ages, right? Um, how can we make this work accessible? Um, my work is inherently accessible to regular people, but you know a lot of work isn't. So um, I would say look out for those exhibitions or advertisements for shows that speak to you um, and go check them out. Go to museums that have a reputation for um, making connections for people between the work and real life. Um, a lot of them exist. You can learn so much about yourself um, just by going and looking at art. Like what moves you? What makes your heart skip a beat? Um, what's boring? You know, what do you gloss over and walk away from? What enraptures you? Paying attention to those things is, you don't have to be an art expert to appreciate and love art and getting out into the world and going to see art in galleries and museums can feel intimidating, but it also can be super enriching and exciting. Yeah. Hold It Lightly will be on view September 13th through December 10th, 2023.